Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Wednesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel, here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis. they got a really, really good show for you today. we got a great guest, new guest on A35, Dan Foreman. He is a, a technology sector specialist at the Maxim Group. He's got some really, really convicted calls on a lot of tech stocks, specifically uh, the semiconductors, and and those types of things, not necessarily big tech as much as uh, you know your your AMDs and your PNWs and, uh, and and stocks of that nature. So we're going to talk to Dan about uh, tech stocks. He's got a lot of calls to make in that sector at eight thirty five. But before we do that, we got some uh, some some action in 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 the food sector. We've got Fed of course today. We have got some earnings, uh, Bed Bath Beyond, Adobe guidance from Steel Dynamics, and of course we'll always take your questions from our chat. Joel, what's new in the markets? Uh, we're coming off one of the quietest sessions I can like ever remember. We only had a five-point range yesterday. Big level. I'm only giving one level here. Dennis loves that. 2506. That was Monday's high. That was Tuesday's high, and that's our high so far. So that's the level to take out on the upside. Crude's looking interesting here. Basis the daily shard. We've had a trading range from 46 to 50 for from little over since July. And now we're trying to close. We did did not close over 50 yesterday, trying today. So this uh could be giving another major uh let boost to the bull market if uh these drug stocks or excuse me, oil stocks can get going. And uh gold on the rebound up 70 770 at 13, 18, 30, silver up 12 cents at 7. 1840. So, Dennis, uh, quiet ranges, but we still have some action to talk about in some stocks. Where, <clears> where a lot of like, action. Where would you today. like? Yeah, the food stocks. So, today looks like your theme, and a little bit of it yesterday as well, is going to be food stock disaster day. I mean, Kellogg's got the beats yesterday because it had the downgrade from. Piper, Piper downgraded it yesterday and it opened pretty much at the highs and just collapsed and lost two and a half points on the day. So they're already hating food stocks going into the General Mills report. And then we had the General Mills report this morning, Spencer, and it was not good. Give us details, GIS. Call me by surprise there, Dennis, but General Mills, you're right, did report Q1 adjusted EPS of 71 cents. That's a five cent miss. 76 cents was the estimate. Sales of 3.8 first 3.79 billion dollars. So they beat that one by a hair. Uh, organic net sales declining one to two percent uh, is what they see going forward. And just EPS, they increased it of one to two percent. So. These food stocks just remain out of favor. I'm so glad I actually had the General Mills in my investment portfolio. I had bought it back when it was kind of getting, I thought it was getting too cheap at like 56 bucks. It went down, it came back up and it got them to the 57s, almost the 58s. And you know, I was like, you know what? And this was actually back in the middle of August. It was like, it's come back a long ways. These things, you know, and then it's the whole thing with the Amazon wildcard. And I was like, you know, that's going to put you know pressure on some of the margins. Maybe people were talking about that. And I didn't consider that in my original investment. So I actually ended up selling it out there. And I'm glad I did because now it's in the 52 handle. And you know what? I'm hands off on these things right now. I know, you know, and, and you can argue, you know, potential for a double bottom here because the low of the move, 52.76. We're below that right now, 52.60. But these things are just out of favor. They're scared of them right now for, you know, whether it's Amazon or whatever it is. Maybe it's just the raging bull market that doesn't stop, that you don't need food stocks. But um, you look at Kellogg's, you look at General Mills, you look at, you know, the other stocks in the sector like Mondelez, you look at K uh, Kraft Heinz, they're all near the lows, all near their 52-week lows. And, you know, when stocks are making new lows, what do I say on the show all the time? Time to go. Time to go. So I'm not coming here and buying these things as I make new lows. You know, if anything, you know, they're sometimes usually better shorts as they're making new lows. So I don't know. It's hard to come in here and say, oh, we're going to short GIS when it's down significantly because a three point move is big. For oh, it, huge. Well, I mean, but I can't come in here buying it either. 
Uh, standard deviations on this three point move. I don't even know how many, uh, how many levels you want to go out on that. You gave uh 5276 former low of the move 5249. That's your print. The thing is you're only 11 cents off that level. So, you know, maybe if you want to hold out for a little bit more, if you're short, you know, use your half and whole numbers, 52, 51 and a half, you know, you'll see if you're getting hit on the bids. If not, there's going to be some kind of rebound in this today. I don't know if we can get back over 54. That seems like where the first prints were uh, off the number, but uh, you know, Buying, buying in down here, you really have no reference point to lean on. You had 6439 print in Kellogg's. Just check the low of these moves and see where it's at. That's taking out the low of the move now. And just see where it is after 15 minutes. But uh, multi-year lows for a lot of these issues. I mean, these are supposed to be defensive stocks that perform well when the market's going down, but the market hasn't been going down, so it's not surprising that these things have been weak. Second thing to consider is these, you know, do trade a little bit off of their dividends, and if you're in a rising rate environment here, it is, you know, maybe good for the banks, it is not good for stocks with yield. So you look at Kellogg's at a 3.29 or GIS at a 3.73, which looks like it's going to even be higher here today. And you think, well, you could even have interest rate concerns baked in here. You know, you got Amazon concerns, interest rate concerns, a lot of reasons not to own these things right now. Plus, you know, you have stocks, you know, just blasting off into orbit, um, you know, every day, like tech stocks that have just been hot as hell. And nobody's interested in these things. Um, you know, they'll get interested in these things when the market starts going down and then they want, you know, some more de defense in their portfolio. But right now, your institutional money is underperforming by owning these stocks. And that's why they sell them. Look at this. Uh, I got a monthly up a Kellogg here. Now, if you talk about a head and shoulders top there, holy mackerel, you got your left shoulder, your right shoulder. That had in eighty seven sixteen. Crazy I mean, that it got to 87 oh, bucks. Remember, remember that run? Remember we were... Go oh. back to the 2016 shows and us talking about that. And we're like, this is insane. These food stocks just going up like this. I'm like, they don't move like this. Like General Mills was up five bucks in one day because somebody was going to buy them. Well, that never materialized. And all we were saying is, you know, when the dust settles here, these <laughs> things, you know, this is a big move. It's a little bit too much too fast. And, you know, obviously, uh, what was that back catalyst? Do you remember? Was it? There was mergers. There was rumors of mergers in the sector. There was, you know, a lot of, uh, I can't remember is that what when, else. Um, is that I know what, General, I think it was General Mills was rumored to be acquired. Was it uh, during the it, Hers there's, Hershey's? There's been a lot of, of M&A rumors and news in, the, in food but, this year. Uh, but have any materialized? Have we seen any well, we just had actual one, mergers? We, we just had one yesterday. <laughs> what? <laughs> What, oh, uh, I'm, obviously. <laughs> okay, so we did. Okay. Actually, but that, okay, but that's not really a food. Uh, okay, okay, you're right. You're right. You're right. Uh, but uh, but as far as like you're talking about the craft Hines and like and, yeah, and, none and, of those. Oh you know, um, no, nothing has materialized. But there's been a lot of rumors. Was it? I mean, the last real big one was Hines actually getting bought by Warren Buffett. That was a long time ago. That that's was, five years ago. Let me but, think. Was it? Uh, was it Hershey? Was it? Was it the Hershey News? Yeah, there you go. Joel, he's always Hershey, in memory. Wait, it was Hershey's. Hershey Mondelez? Were Mondelez. That's well, that, 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 that's been kicking memory. around. Oh, come on now. That's been kicking around for like a year. No, no. We were, that was in 2016, we were saying. That yeah. was the driver that yeah. really took okay. us off. Because back, if you look at July 2016, Hershey went from 97 bucks to 117 <laughs> in one day. 20 <laughs> points on a food stock, a chocolate food stock, <laughs> in one day. That was insane. It gave it all back like a month later or two months later. And, and you know what? Hirsch is actually holding up there at uh, 109.41. Hey, there's one for you guys. It hasn't really sold off that much yet. Uh, not exactly like a Kellogg's. Not exactly. But, you know, it's, it's not classified as a food stock. It's a chocolate food stock. Uh, uh, Kellogg uh, peaked in July of 2016, coincidentally. Uh, when did um, General Mills peaked in July 2016? And then I got tanned trying to short this one, Tyson chicken, but that one, that's the yeah. ones I guess people are still eating chicken here because uh, 7705, that was the high of that move and uh, still hanging out at 66. So I guess uh, Tyson chicken might be Amazon proof. I don't know. I uh, think all these things get hit today, personally. And I think they all get hit today because this is a pretty, you know, so it obviously the direct peers for General Mills is Kellogg. 
Kellogg got hit hard yesterday, though. So I'm not sure how much gas is still left in Kellogg, but it's already down another box. So obviously there's a little bit of gas here left. Um, that's the direct appeal. Campbell's Soup 2, CPB, which obviously got hit on its earnings report just about you know three weeks ago. While well, CPB is going to be challenging those lows or getting act- actually closer to them this morning. It's down Ooh. another 60, 70 cents here in the pre-market. Um, I mean, how chat chime in. I mean, how many people eat cereal for breakfast? You know, I mean, it's been replaced by yogurts and muffins and all this organic uh, stuff. So, all right. Uh, food. St- oh, uh, the chef. Is, oh, chef. He must be a food stock trader. He's me- he's mentioning uh, PBC. I think that's Pilgrim's Pride. They're kind of chicken, too, though, aren't they? they kind of, yeah. Pilgrim's Pride, though, is a merger, isn't it? Isn't there somebody buying Pilgrims, or are they merging with somebody? I think uh, wasn't that they, announced no, like a they, couple weeks ago? They bought someone for one point. They bought Moy, oh, they bought Moy, Moy Park for one point three billion dollars. I think all these stocks. I'd be cautious on any food stock today. Anything with food, I think that they're going to hit here today. And there's multiple reasons for that. Obviously, the number one catalyst here, though, we have a catalyst now, and that's the General Mills report. So I'd be very cautious with any food stock here this morning. All right, let's. Uh... We want to catch up a couple things in the chat here before we move on. We don't want to forget. Uh, we were, uh, well, let's go to BBY. BBY's tanking and uh, <laughs> great report. And out of that hard one. yesterday. So what happened here, Spencer? Yesterday, for, for Best Buy? Day, yeah, uh, for, yeah. Be- for Best Buy. Uh, well, they had their first uh, investor day yesterday in like five years, uh, which. Uh, shouldn't you know, do that again. <laughs> shouldn't, wait another five shouldn't do that again uh no apparently the analysts and, and, and the investors uh were, were not impressed uh, at all they did come out yesterday morning with uh some uh enterprise revenue guidance for fiscal year uh 21 yeah that was weird that was that was bizarre um where they basically said they're going to make 43 billion dollars in the fiscal year 21 which uh okay great that's I don't know why they do that. You know, three why years, would they three, three years away? But uh, I don't know exactly what they said at the investor day. I, I just know it, it wasn't good. Well, definitely not good. And stock gets murdered yesterday here again. Maybe they said Amazon's coming for them or something. But 50 Amazons are trying to come for them for years and they aren't, isn't working. It's The funny one is, like we've already said, you know, we said this on the show multiple times, the one stock you thought was going to get Amazon the worst has been the one that's been the most resilient to Amazon, and that's Best Buy. So people go in there and they, you know, actually they do the Amazon price match thing there now. And it's held up very well considering, you know, where this got to back, I believe it was 2011 when I thought and me and Joel, you know, were definitely not on board of 2012 when it got down to 11 bucks, um, you know, and it had been over 50. I guess that was the buying opportunity. Me and Joel were just like, this is like the showroom for Amazon. Nobody's buying things anymore. Well, we were wrong on that because they came all the way back up to the highs. So we get some, a few of them wrong sometimes too, but Best Buy, 52.76 here now, Joel. Give us your thoughts from a technical perspective. Uh, I mean, there's a couple big red candles here. This is looking in the monthly, though. I'm going to go uh, to the dailies. I don't like that you took out the low of the move. Uh, and you filled the gap. The only positive thing here, let's see if we can hang in here at 52. You gapped up after the uh, Q1 report. You came down. Man, those gaps fill. Now the question is, is can you hold 52 and rebound? I still think you got some more work on the upside. I think if we really want to bring this thing in 50 bucks, I see a low the day before that big earnings day at uh, 50, 29. So needs to hold in here 52, but that's a, that's a big red ugly candle after rebounding from earnings. So 50 bucks, that's my target on this one. Jumping over here to other earnings, um, there was three big reports from last night. Uh, one that got hit really hard and still down here significantly this morning, probably bringing the XRT a bit down with it. Bed Bath & Beyond, the Triple BY, I guess the BBY brother-in-law, Joel, uh, Triple BY down 13% here in the pre-market. They disappointed here, Spencer. What did they say? This is what happens when I go to the Bath Beyond for the first time in like eight years, uh, which I did over the weekend. You didn't spend enough money there. It's clearly not. I need to go back more often. More uh, towels. <laughs> Q2 adjusted <laughs> EPS. Candles. I need Q- some more candles. Q2 adjusted EPS, 78 cents versus a 95 cent estimate. Uh, fiscal year uh, EPS of uh, $3. And uh, not estimates were up over four, weren't they? Yeah. 
yes, estimates were up. So you're you're falling well short of estimates. They halted this ahead of it, and I was like, oh, what are we going to be able to hit here? You know, because <laughs> I like to trade them off the earnings report. And I'm like, William Sonoma, I thought about, but it was already offered down 50 cents, and it's offered down here again. But they were even hitting the XRT on this last night. XRT trade down to 40 and a quarter. I felt that was a little bit overdone. Actually, I'm long a little bit of XRT. Just I thought they overdid it a bit, but they started hitting every retail sector that might or retail stock today that might not be the case so direct peers i would say william sonoma you know does uh, often move with triple by um yeah it's a hard one there's not a lot of like pure plays on it just a matter of whether it brings down retail altogether joel break down the lower, lower the days in dennis 2150 well, lunch, that, lunch that got overdone yeah. they always overshoot Especially okay. when they halt these things, so everybody's like right ah, out of there. <laughs> yeah, twenty one fifty. That's your pre market low. Bounced up, had a nice rebound at twenty five, but resistance, short term resistance, coming in at twenty three and a half, twenty one and a half. I man, if I was trying to bring in a short, that would be the level. This is taking back this. Oh boy, I came and I got to go to the monthlies here to see how long we're going back here. Uh, in triple B Y man. Oh man. Oh man. I don't know if it's ever been this low, Dennis. I'm going 2007. Probably has it over way, way back, back way back. Uh, let's see here. Don't 2398. We've already taken that out. Uh, the next monthly low you have is 1911. And that was March of 2009. So you're getting back to financial crisis levels. But once again, 21 and a half, I think the lows in, I'd even, if I was short, I'd see if I could bring in <clears> stock <throat> at 22. And I just think you find buyers underneath where this thing is going to go on a rally. I have no idea. Yeah, and no, I just don't think it's going to be. Well, you never know. The only the one thing to consider, though, and we've seen this on a few, you know, this was a disaster report. So it's not like this thing's getting back to scratch. But you do see a lot of people. I don't know what the short interest is on this. I didn't check the it. Cover, but exactly. You, exactly. You do see sometimes the covering help. And then sometimes you do see some people coming in just saying, oh, it's it's a value play, you know. But I've, I've even been that player before there and been stuck in these value traps before in some of these retailers. And that's why. I'm just hands out. I mean, it's just these sectors are so depressed. If I look at, and you know, I've talked about my investment portfolio lots in the show. I've got almost a hundred stocks in there. I I don't think I have one retail stock and I don't think I have one food stock now. And that is simply because these sectors are just so out of favor. And I'm really glad. I mean, it's really helping me that I don't have, you know, a Macy's or something like that killing me in there. I want to put some some of these in there just because I feel like some of them are so cheap. I don't know if it's Bed Bath and Beyond them, you know, that's these stores, stores that they huge. send you in on a big circle in the store and you know you see wall to wall towels in there. I, I don't know about that one, but the Coles has always interested me. I've talked about it on the show there too. Kramer was pumping Coles last night on his show, um, you know, and he get, get, got a little lift when he was saying, you know, that this is the one that he likes too. I kind of agree with Kramer, but it's run too far for me now. It's went from 37 to 47 or to 45 and a half basically in a month. And I feel like it's gone too far too fast for me now. I have bought it before in the 30s once, sold it in the 40s. I wish I would have did it again in August. I could have did the trade twice on it. Uh, but I'm just... I'm just so gun shy on the retailers just because I've seen every time I've bought retailers like that or, you know, come in there, you get killed. So that's why I'm gun shy on the retailers. Uh, comments on Kohl's here. You're getting into a gappy area. You need 5009. So if you're holding out for a target on that one, we did uh, sell off the high from yesterday. Also, they're allowing Amazon like to our people to return products they bought on Amazon at their store. I don't know. I mean, I guess that's bringing in traffic. So I guess that could be construed as a good. But Dennis, one general observation here, you know, we've been doing this show for a while. It seems like you're a little bit more nimble in your portfolio here. You're like you're getting in some stuff and it's your long term portfolio. You're holding it and then you're not holding it. I, is it just uh, something symptomatic of the market? No, no, no. It be, and, and I'm still holding a lot of things. Like I said, I've had MasterCard in my portfolio for 10 years. I've always been somewhat nimble. So I don't like getting, you know, even in my investment portfolio, I don't buy stuff. And then it's if the thesis isn't working or the stock is turning red, like, you know, I was talking with Ford. I'm already looking, you know, maybe I should be, you know, sneaking out of that somehow or taking a small loss on it because, you know, I don't want to, you know, get stuck with these things that go to zero. I've, I've had, you know, stocks in there that, you know, that you know, really killed me in the past. One of my worst ones ever was Barrett Gold when I bought it at like $40, you know, and I ended up selling it later on at like 15 just to take the tax life sell or to you know, sell it off. And, you know, and then gold stocks, I don't have a lot of those in my portfolio anymore either. Is that burning them? 
Um, but my portfolio, you know, what I have, if I was just to analyze it, I have a lot of, like I said, preferred stock. A lot of preferred stock yielding 6 7% because I feel like the preferred stock is such a nice way to have a low beta portfolio that yields pretty well. Now, I'm not getting these 20% returns at the market, so I'm definitely underperforming in the last two or three years, four years, because we've been in a bull market that's really taken off. But I, I way overperform, you know, during the financial crisis because I have so much preferred stock. You know, I way overperform in a bear market. So in, in the long term, if you look at the overall market, it yields you, you know, six, seven percent really over the course of like the fifth, you know, hundred years. You know, the markets, you know, that you know, if you if you go back to the data, well, I have preferred stock giving me six, seven percent. So I feel like it's just a you know cleaner way, easier way that I'm almost getting as much as you know what the market yields overall. With very little low, with very low beta. So if I was to analyze it, you know, almost I bet you thirty or forty percent of my holdings are preferred stocks. So which is you know a bad call right now in the last few years, but it's been a great call over my twenty year right. career. So you know, but I've got also in my portfolio, you know, I've got a lot of tech stocks. I've got a lot of you know different different types of stocks. Like I've had Apple for a lot of years. I've had Google for a lot of years. So I do have some growth in there, but I'm definitely more focused to the dividends. And, you know, when I get a stock, you know, in general, electric's been a bad one. But, you know, you get, you know, the stocks that give you a dividend yield plus, you know, a little bit of growth. Those are gems. Uh, Fuzzy is asking, can the average Joe buy preferred? Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. There's, oh, yeah. That's all kinds. So PFF is one way chef is saying, you know, I don't have PFF. It's 5.67. I've always been like, once they get into the fives, I don't like them as much. I feel like five is too low. I always wanted the sevens. That's what I always went to. The one I had forever was this Dillard's preferred. And it's still out there, DDT. I had this for like 10 years in my best portfolio, play, paying me seven or, you know, and actually I bought it during the financial crisis. So it was paying me a lot more than that. But, you know, it's a yield of 7.29. I sold it last year just because I don't even want to own a preferred of a retail <laughs> stock. I'm not scared. Because Dillard's itself, you know, like I look at it and it's come down if you go at the monthlies. It's come from $140 down to 56. If that was to ever get, get into the 30s or 20s, now they'd start to maybe you know you know bring that thing down below par again you know, on below twenty five bucks and you know then then that can start to get ugly. I mean J C Penny prefers you know there's one H J V. Um, you know these are these are scary because we don't know if J C Penny's valuable. It pays eleven point eight percent, but it's J C Penny. Is J C Penny even going to you know it's it's been around for forever, but you know you don't know three dollars and ninety seven cents. Is J C Penny going to be around in you know two or three years? We don't know that. That's why the preferred yielding eleven point eight percent. I don't know J C Penny preferreds, and I just got scared last year that Dillard's could potentially go that same way, and that's why after ten years of my investment portfolio, I finally sold my D D T, which was my Dillard's preferred. But there's lots of other ones there too um, that yield in the sixes. So um, you know, I can give you a list of them if you want them. But you know, um, and I can go look at them. Uh, but you know, they're not. Yeah. When I was picking all these up, they were mostly in the sevens. So they've just come up enough that they're in the sixes now. Like I was picking up Goldman Sachs preferreds a few years ago with six and a half percent yields. They're in the fives now. So I still own some of these things. But they're not as attractive to come in when they're yielding five, five and a half, as they are six and a half or seven, because a one and a half percent makes a world of difference in the long run. Uh, Fuzzy, I'm not sure what platform you're on, but, uh, you know, you're, you should have the preferred stocks listed on just about any any platform. Uh, cause they, have, the yeah. symbology is weird. Like it's they use a hyphen sometimes. Uh, Ed Parker saying the NLY. I've had those two, Annaly Capital Management. There's a bunch of them. You can go nly.pr. E, that's yielding 7.54%. NLY.PRA, um, that's an older one. I guess they called that one. But there's just a ton of them out there. Like you're talking hundreds of different preferred stocks. And I think it's a nice way. If you've got an investment portfolio, I think there's still a nice way to add some diversification and some low beta. You know, you get a 7.5% yield on that thing at a very low beta. Now, you always have to remember the underlying stock is, you know, what's paying it. So if there's problems in the underlying, like I was saying, you know, Dillard's has been having problems lately, that might be a sign that you might want to hit the X button or preferreds. Because typically, the, the common will fall for a long time before they start hitting the preferreds. So, you know, you usually have a lot of warning on these things. Like, for example, you know, during the financial crisis, the Bear Stearns, Bear Stearns was up over $200 a share. It had gotten down to under 80 before they actually started hitting the Bear Stearns preferred. So, you know, these things usually have to fall in half and then you may be even further than that 
usually before they start hitting the preferreds. So one, you know, that's just on the credit risk part. The other thing is the time that they will hit preferreds is when interest rates start to go up because these trade like bonds. So if you've got interest rates going to fly high, they will hit the preferreds. So that's, you know, sometimes a great opportunity too, because I'm still of the belief that interest rates are low for the foreseeable future. I don't think it's ever going back to 8, 10, no 12% way. interest rates. If we were going back there, that preferred portfolio of mine would get annihilated. Because, you know, if we went to 10, 12% interest rates and I'm sitting with a 7.5% preferred, well, that's going to correct itself because it's going to want to trade Great above price. where the current rate is. It's going to want to trade to a 15% yield on those things because there's risk involved with those. So if we went to 12% interest rates, those preferreds would go to 15. My preferred portfolio would get cut in half. I do not believe we are ever going up to 12, 15% interest rates again. Everybody lives on debt now. Interest rates, I believe, are long for the foreseeable future, you know, and maybe, you know, for forever. Or they're going to try to keep them all forever. So, you know, if you believe we're always going to be at one, two, three percent yields here for the long for the long haul, like we can go up a quarter, we can go up a half, we can go up a point. But this 10, 12, 15 percent that we saw, you know, 10, 12s in the, you know, the early 90s and then the 80s, 20 percent. It's long gone because everybody lives on debt and the world would be in a world of hurt if we were paying 20 percent. interest. Rate. Nobody would afford their houses. You wouldn't see these house prices where they were if we had 20 percent interest rates. All right, uh, man, we're getting some good uh, good chat here. Chili Traders talking about the stock RAS, how this thing's hanging out at 50 cents, and uh, they finally hit the preferreds on that one. Uh, he has RF, uh, TA. Now, that's a sign. That, that's a great – okay, so – and I just want to just hold you. Go ahead. Just before you move on. So Chili Trader making an excellent, excellent point here. RFTA is the preferred of RAS. RAS – is a 60 cent stock now this looks like it's going out of business like it you know go out the long term here you know this is an eight nine bucks it's now 60 cents yet the rfta which is the preferred of that stock is still only 25 21 it's only down you know so if you were put the investment in ras you'd be down like 90 percent. you went to the preferred of it you're down like 10 15 percent only so now that is a scary one. I don't think I would touch that RFTA because <laughs> at 8.19, that almost looks like a short to me because, you know, if these things go under. But even in, in, in an event where some of these things go under, sometimes there's something left for the preferreds. Now, the bonds and, and another point being made by Jimmy A is the venture back preferreds are even, you know, more senior to some of the preps. So, you know, if you're into buying, you know, higher risk ones, you got to look, you know, what's senior in the event that, you know, this RAS does go under. Is there going to be something left for those preferreds? Are these notes? Are these bonds? You know, and maybe RFTA is a bond. Some of these preferreds aren't preferred. Some of them actually trade as bonds, traded bonds on the exchange, too. So a, gr a great site is Quantum Online. Q U uh, Quantum T A N T U M online.com. And if you just type in there, they have all the information, they have the prospectus on each preferred. Whenever I'm buying a new one, I go to quantumonline.com. I type it in, I read about it, and I understand it before I put them in. You know, make sure you understand how the coupons are paid. Some of these things start, you know, as, you know, fixed and they go to floating after five years. So you got to be careful on that too. You could have a preferred that's paying you 7%. All of a sudden, the five years is up and they drop your yield to three and a half and it's like uh, what happened what well, was the fixed to floating preferred so you know you want to see these perpetual where they're paying them for you know the life of the of, of the issue so there's lots of you know different uh, information you get from quantum online great site for the preferreds and uh boy dennis we are bringing out the preferred traders in the chat look at, today. All I know, in look at these guys they're acting like they're all slingers and day trading stocks and meanwhile they're just Sitting there collecting their three, four, five, six percent. I mean, I think it's more than that. Most of your preferreds, so, you rarely find a preferred under five, so seven, eight percent. Some of these, yeah. What's the symbol for travel centers? I got the uh, I the preferred, TA? um, no, I got the still... I got the preferred TA. Oh, look, oh, yeah, no, they're mentioning uh, Brenster just gave yeah. me the symbol on that one TA Travel Centers of America. This T A N N L. So this one. That's another scary one. That's though. a scary You're talking one about a stock that's significantly down. There's risk involved with that. And that's why the T A N N L does trade with an 8.62. Whenever you see them up over eight, it's probably a little bit of risk in the underlying because they don't just sit there with eights, you know, 8% dividends here right now in, in this environment. The fives are usually, you know, that's where they are right now. The preferreds typically trade in the fives. Like if you look at like a Goldman Sachs preferred or you look at, you know, a Bank of America preferred. 
Um, most of those are trading in the fives because they're, you know, there's not much credit risk there right now, at least, you know, not right now, unless we get another financial crisis. But, you know, you get to these travel centers ones or the JC Penny ones, they're going to trade with higher yields because there is credit risk involved in those. All right. Uh, one stock that's really been in the news that we haven't talked about as of late is uh, Equifax. Um, EFX, uh, the bad news just continues to come out on this. Uh, $90. I don't know when people are going to try and uh, actually put a bottom in this, but we did. I think it. they're trying right now. Yeah, they are. They are. They are. eighty nine fifty nine, And then you protected that low yesterday. Uh, could be an interesting trading day in uh, EFX because you have matched rages from the day before. Not quite an inside day, but just barely an outside day. I like to set up here, and I'll tell you, if I'm short this uh, um, this Equifax, I'm trying to lock in profits, this thing gets into the 96 handle. I'm out. Three highs, 535, 506, and 569. So try. I feel like you're late to the party if you're trying to short it now. No, it's down 50 bucks on well, this. Well, you, you, uh, Reuters did publish a video yesterday where they quoted a technology law attorney, attorney saying that Equifax, he says, will most likely file for bankruptcy. No. What? So, well, okay. Well, you know, maybe there's it's never too late. Dennis. It's, it's never too late. Happens, so. um, I just want to do the seller exhaust. High risk. I want to do, do a seller exhaustion theory on this one. Uh, when things started out, it traded about 500 grand. And then the first day it got hit, it traded 17 million. And then you had 9 million, 7 million, another 17 million, 35 million, 16 million, 10 million, and only 8 million yesterday. So maybe everyone that's out, you know, that wants out of the long headline. Yeah. Until the next, yeah. Until they get CMG. But, uh, Interesting setup here. I just think that the low volume is like the sellers are, you know, you know, taking it easy. Uh, MSU might have nothing to worry about. Uh, Travel Center. He has the book value at fourteen. Oh, that's our that's our, our resident stock expert, uh, Matt Kolb, who we're gonna have to get on the show here soon. That's Kolb, Sam. That's Kolb. He's he's saying Kolb. Kolb. He's in there. He what? If we didn't, if we weren't coming up against a break, we would uh, we would get him up here. But uh, I think he's he's been bullish his travel centers for a while. He likes the preferred, so we'll keep an eye on that. Dennis, two minutes to our, our first guest and only. With two more earnings report. Can we do them in two minutes? Yeah, of course. If you don't FedEx. go on to like a preferred rant. Spencer, fly, FedEx. I can only, I can only oh, type, really I can only type ticker so fast. I can only type so fast. Uh, uh, $2.51 $2. <laughs> for three versus $3.09 sales, uh, 15.3 versus $15.35 billion. They are uh, cutting their fiscal year adjusted EPS outlook. Yeah, cutting the year. And so they said nothing good. Look at the stock they're holding up. Wow, this thing got down. Where did it get down? 207. To? Two hundred seven bounce. So you know what? We held up well. They said a lot of bad stuff in this report, and it held up pretty well. And that bodes well for those for the bulls out there. There's still a case. As long as we're above two hundred five, I'm going to say bulls are in control. And at two thirteen, we're still well in control here. So you know, it was an ugly report. Am I coming in here buying it on an ugly report? No, but you know, it's telling you they don't want to sell it on this ugly report either. They still like FedEx. Price discovery here in uh, two twelve to two thirteen. As we've been trading after the wild action, so I'd see how it uh, feathers out between there above 213 some more upside on the downside 212 basis the daily chart uh if we get down to 209.67 that was your september 8th low all right what's the other report adobe 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 okay adobe a dollar a dollar ten cents versus a dollar one cent sales of 1.84 versus 1.82 billion dollars so beat on the eps slight beat on the sales uh, they see Q4 just EPS coming in uh, higher and sales coming in in line. They bought it and then they decided, no, nah, expectations were too high and then they hit it. Wild range, 159 down to 15070. Price discovery going on in the 152 handle. I don't know. May I, if I'm looking 150, I don't know. This chart's too all over the place. I'm going to reserve comment on this one, and I'm going to go to Spencer. And he says we got a really good guest coming up. Who is that, Spencer? That's, that, that is what I say. Dan Foreman. He's a technology sector specialist at the Maxim Group. He's got some really, really good convicted analysis on uh, tech stocks. So we'll be right back with Dan Foreman.
Welcome back, everyone, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis Dick, and we're on with Dan Foreman, technology spe uh, sector specialist at the Maxim Group. Dan, how's it going today? Hey, good morning. Um, How are you guys? We're doing great, doing great. So give us a quick uh, two-second uh, two uh, background since, you, since we haven't had you on the show before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I apologize. I'm a little bit sick, so okay. um, bear with me here. But um, so I work as a technology sector specialist here at Maxim Group. Um, so what I do is I write effectively desk research for a qualified select list of institutional investors who I sort of, you know, sell to and provide investment research within the technology sector to um, and so that's my primary function. Then let's get to some some of your coverage. So AMD is one. Joel and I were talking about that yesterday. It's really sort of been hanging out uh, between 12 and 15 for, for for a hot minute here. Give us your thoughts yeah. uh, on, on AMD. Well, AMD is interesting because, um, you know, the stock has been sort of chewing through supply. Uh, if you recall, they priced a block of stock from uh, the largest shareholder. If you pull up the holders list. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the size of that block was, um, but I think it was a fairly sizable chunk of stock. Uh, what's interesting is actually that um, at the t if you look at the holders list, his share position has actually increased Mobadala development, uh, which is interesting. I don't know if they if they did some kind of convert or something, but um, so the stock has been working through that supply, and I think that's why we've been in this kind of recent downtrend on the daily since they reported the quarter and took the stock to, uh, you know, sort of 15 and change. Um, if you, if you look at it on a daily, I sort of, I sort of think that you've got potentially um, kind of a loose inverse head and shoulder forming, which would argue for uh, sort of higher prices. And, and right now we're sort of breaking over the short term downtrend on the daily, but on the weekly, um, I think we're sort of testing uh, a, a sort of longer term weekly downtrend. So if we can break above that, um, I think the stock is likely going to see 15 again and then potentially even higher prices. But, um, you know, we need some fundamental data points to also come along and drive this. And this morning we actually have news coming out of DigiTimes <laughs> talking about the fact that the, the Intel notebook CPU is potentially delayed again. So that could have a positive impact on AMD stock price, uh, the, you know, on a short term basis. I think really the key to the stock, though, is the server piece of the business because that's really where the ASPs are going to come in. Uh, and drive the gross margins. And, you know, that's what really the bulls need to see for this stock to work. And AMD, um, you know, when they do have a server cycle, which has been a very long time, but when they do, the stock has traditionally worked very, very well. So that's really what the bulls are hoping for. And um, we, we we just need to, you know, kind of see them press release more and more server wins. There was a block trade uh, from yesterday, uh, 981,000 shares at 1319. Is that what you're referring to? No, I'm actually referring back to after they reported the quarter. Um, I, I don't know who had the block. I think it was one of the bulls brackets, um, and it, it was a it was it was a very sizable block. I think it was like five or ten million shares. I forget exactly how much it was. Maybe it was even more. I apologize. I don't remember the details yeah, of that. Okay, uh, but let's move on to another one. Uh, what about L I T E? Thoughts on that? Uh, okay, so Lament is a stock that I've been I've been talking very actively with a number of my clients about. Um, and uh, so this is one where some, I have about three or four of the larger holders on my customer list. Um, and, you know, really, Lamentum is an interesting situation because the stock, uh, you know, sort of ran to 52 week highs on the enthusiasm around the fact that they were going to be a component vendor for Apple, uh, you know, for 3D sensing. Uh, and so the, the, the stock sort of priced that in and that began to pull back. Um, and it, it, for the last two quarters in a row, it's kind of been an interesting situation where the stock pulled back into the quarter. Two quarters ago, they gapped it up and ran it to new highs as they talked about the opportunity for 3D sensing. And then this quarter, it's been more fitful where, you know, they basically talked about a, a $200 million revenue opportunity. And uh, it seems like some of the investors out there came away thinking that number might be too aggressive and have they set quite high expectations on a short term basis. Um, and yet the stock kind of continues to sort of test, uh, you know, 59 and 60 uh, on, on a short term basis. So I think we're working through some overhead supply um, as investors become increasingly confident in the longer term opportunity here. I, I think I think what's interesting about momentum is that on the optical side where, you know, traditionally this is the old JDS uniphase they have. 
you know, a lot of a lot of exposure. There's there's been this kind of inventory digestion, uh, you know, period happening because of their exposure to China. So if you're if you're paying attention to what the component vendors within the optical supply chain have been saying, they're all sort of talking about the fact that they don't exactly know when this period of inventory digestion is going to end. Um, but you know, I think I think the bet you're placing with momentum right now is that we're closer to the end there, uh, you know, than not. It's just a function of timing. Um, and, you know, on that point, you saw an analyst uh, upgrade Acacia yesterday talking through this, you know, dynamic of sort of digesting inventory. Uh, Acacia, you know, just to jump ship there for a second to that stock, um, you know, is very heavily exposed to ZT. I believe it's their largest customer. So, um, you know, that's that's going to be a, another name that, you know, if we if we work our way through this inventory digestion period in China, then, you know, that stock should likely begin to work as well. But back to momentum, um, you know, you can see, at least I think the stock is is sort of fighting with this, you know, 59 to $60 level. And I think what's happened is there's a debate in the marketplace. Some, some PMs and analysts are maybe thinking that they need to lighten up as we work, as we work into, you know, the launch sort of buy the rumor, sell the news. Uh, and then some analysts and, um, you know, PMs, I think are, are much longer term oriented and really thinking that this could be, you know, a 60, 70, $75 stock on kind of a $4 earnings power number consensus is sort of three and change. So uh, I think you're you're you know you're set uh, you're set up if you're if you're willing to look out a period of time and not just kind of the next 24 48 hours for potentially some upward revisions and momentum as um, you know we start to see like Qualcomm is announcing their solution for 3D sensing to help the Android ecosystem um, you know to a sort of fast follow, right? That's kind of what they're referring to. Uh, you know, the competitors who are going to follow Apple as we move into this sort of 3D sensing opportunity. And and also 3D sensing isn't just uh, cell phones. There's a, there's applications outside of cell phones, but obviously that's a very big unit, Tam. Um, so that's going to get people very excited if, you know, the X takes off. A couple questions from the chat here. Not, sure, not sure if you follow these yeah, issues, sorry. but uh, Nutanix, NTNX, so I guess we'll start with that. You follow that Sure, one? yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, thoughts on, on sure. Go ahead. Do you do you have thoughts on NTNX? I, I do. Um, you know, we we so so taking a step back. Um, I, as I said earlier, I work at Maxim. We have an analyst here who officially covers Nutanix. His name is Nahal Choksi, and um, you know he's quite bullish on the stock. Maybe one of the most bullish. Um, and so. Uh, you know, Nutanix, um, I think it was, you know, Goldman who wrote that it's like a decade, you know, once in a decade type of opportunity. The, the, the debate on Nutanix is really should it be valued as a software company or is it a, you know, infrastructure hardware company? Um, and if you uh, believe that the mix is shifting to more software uh, and that the stock deserves to be valued at a higher multiple, then, you know, effectively that decision makes you a buyer of Nutanix. Um, and um, as I'm sure you're aware, Nutanix recently announced that they are making changes to the way that they account for the selling of their technology. I think it's 606 is the accounting rule. And so um, they are, uh, they are. They saw some other revisions on the back of that. I, 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 I apologize. I can't um, break down the exact moving parts of 606 right now. I, it's a couple of weeks ago that they held that call, and I don't remember all the moving parts. But um, so Nutanix is a Nutanix is a very interesting company, in my opinion. You know, the bear case is that they had a relationship with Dell, and so there's an overhang there. Um, and you know, you've got very well uh, funded competitors like HP who have made some acquisitions in the space. Uh, so you've got kind of the, the, the larger competitors that are gonna drive prices lower uh, and you would eventually see margin compression in Nutanix, I think would be kind of the simple bear case on Nutanix. And um, you know, we're, we're at a point in the life cycle of the company where I think it remains to be seen exactly how this is going to play out. And the, and the bulls are gonna believe that Nutanix is really the leader in you know, hybrid um, and, you know, hybrid basically, uh, you know, is a very potentially large market opportunity, um, you know, and you're talking about providing a company, uh, you know, with a, a hybrid cloud strategy so that they don't have to be beholden to an Amazon Web Services. So the stakes are higher. Another one from the chat. I don't know if you follow this. Uh, Veritone, V-E-R-I. Crazy, crazy. Sorry. 
crazy. I really thing. don't know it. I have I have a few clients who have been trading it because it's been a momentum stock, but yeah. I know nothing about the moving parts of the fundamentals. Right, I apologize. Great. No, that's yeah, always appreciate the honesty. But let, let's get back to some of your coverage then. Uh, thoughts on Palo Alto Networks? They they, they have an analyst day coming up. Uh, so Palo Alto Networks has been um, you know a stock that. Uh, has sort of been coming off the bottom for the last two quarters. It's gapped twice. Um, you know, going back two quarters ago, uh, they gapped the stock up coming out of quarter because there's been so much skepticism around the uh, expectations. Really, um, has been has been the issue for the stock. I think more than anything. Um, and what's interesting about Palo Alto Networks is that you know they finally guided um, you know the full year numbers for next year to kind of a mid-teens billings growth rate. And so, uh, in my opinion, uh, you know the expectations have been reset, and um, you have a potentially very large product cycle that they can sell into their install base as they come out with a series of new products. Um, and they have a very large install base, and you know basically this is the the company with the broadest portfolio and security software. Um, the stock hasn't responded to, you know, the Equifax uh, issues largely because I think people are buying Symantec for that. Uh, I think maybe partially due to the LifeLock acquisition um, and the fact that it's more of a consumer, uh, you know, issue for Equifax than it is Palo Alto. But I've been surprised actually that Palo Alto hasn't moved a little bit higher on that. Um, and you know that the stock is sort of digesting the recent gap up coming out of last quarter as well. Um, and I think it's really only a matter of time before the stock makes new highs. Um, we're watching the 20 period moving average sort of catch up to the stock price. Um, it's sort of rise, rising slowly and with an analyst day coming next week, that may be the catalyst that takes the stock higher. The caveat here is that they announced on the most recent call that the CFO is leaving. And so some, institutional investors just don't want to own stocks where this is where there's a CFO transition and they just don't know who the next, you know, CFO is going to be. All right, Dan, uh, I'll, I'll get you on, on one more and then we'll let you get out of here. Uh, give us your thoughts right now on OSTK. Okay. So Overstock is a company that is really not very well followed um, on Wall Street and is a stock that I spent a lot of time um, focused on, especially since um, the company reported the last quarter. So if you go back to, um, I don't know if you can at the same time as I am, go back to kind of August 4th where you have that big, big candle down and then up and then the stock took off and, and started making new highs. Um, the company reported the quarter that day, and what happened is they came out on the call and effectively told investors that um, they may spin. Um, actually, take a step back. They came out and they said that they were going to tell us something, and then shortly thereafter, they basically said that they may spin the Medici division, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Overstock. And for those who don't know Overstock, what Medici is a sort of a venture capitalist that is actively investing in blockchain technology. So for those you know traders who are trading Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, actually Overstock is a derivative way to invest in that theme, largely because they have this subsidiary called Medici that is invested across uh, you know a variety of different um, end markets with blockchain technology investments. And so one of the investments is a trading platform, and um, they have sort of implied that they may spin Medici through that trading platform. So we still have a number of catalysts in front of us for overstock. Um, so the recent move up, uh, you know, while it looks like the stock uh, arguably uh, could be extended on a short-term basis, I actually think that we're, we're likely to make new highs. If you look at valuation, it depends on which way you want to look at it, but the stock trades on an EV to revenue multiple at 0.3 times sales, comp that to, I don't, I don't know what, take any retailer that you want. Uh, it trades at a discount to JCPenney, which, you know, is considered arguably to be toxic. So, um, you know, Overstock's very interesting, and if Overstock... Um, for those who don't know it, this is kind of a comp to Wayfair. They do a lot of outdoor furniture. Um, and so it's a front end retail, uh, you know, e-commerce business um, that would be a very good fit for a number of, uh, you know, kind of traditional brick and mortar uh, retailers. So, you know, you, I, I heard you guys speaking earlier today about like Bed Bath & Beyond, for example, on the earlier call. Um, so, you know, Overstock could be uh, a potential target for a Bed Bath if somebody like Bed Bath wanted to kind of juice their e-commerce uh, business. 
Uh, Dan, one quick question here. Uh, your, your your discussion here, you do you throw in a lot of fundamental analysis. You also throw in some technical analysis, which you have to do in the markets. Uh, just any, yeah. just if you could like sum up your technical analysis, uh, you know, favorite patterns or, you know, sure. do, do you get into the fancy stuff, RSIs, you simple support sure. resistance guy? Could you just, you know, give our viewers um, an idea of your method of technical analysis? Um, so, um, so by way of background, um, I started in the business um, coming out of law school. And so I went uh, into institutional equity sales. Um, so I spent many, many years kind of pitching um, ideas to portfolio managers and over the years kind of built a reputation for having decent alpha generation skills um, and uh, eventually got more and more specialized, went to Morgan Stanley and worked as a technology sector specialist and, and now also at Maxim. But in between, I managed capital for uh, Wedbush and their market strategies division for a number of years trading um, in the tech sector long short. And I read a book called Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets by John Murphy. Okay. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with this, but that is really kind of the the basis for my technical analysis skills, in addition to the fact that I spent a lot of time talking to traders who traded for a living um, and uh, got a, a very, you know, sort of got a stronger sense talking more closely with traders for a variety of different types of things. I mean, for, for a while, I was talking with a lot of guys who look at the marks, for example, on Bloomberg. But what I like to look at is, you know, is a stock oversold? I like to look at candles the most. So a candle will tell me, are we starting to see selling pressure? Are we starting to see buying pressure? Are we starting to get oversold conditions? If I can wrap some relative strength analysis around that as well, great. But I like to understand where I am also in the context of the weekly and the monthly. So, um, you know, uh, Palo Alto, if you, for example, were to pull up a monthly, you'll see that that stock has actually broken over a very long-term monthly downtrend with a big monthly triangle. So that informs my opinion in the sense that I'm bullish, right? I think there's a big product cycle. And on top of it, I know that within the context of the monthly, we've broken over a long-term triangle. You need, I think you're looking at a daily right now on Palo Alto. So you need to jump to a monthly. Um, and it's you can see, see, that, see that downtrend. Yep. So if you draw if you draw the line, you're going to see that we've actually broken over that downtrend on the monthly, and to me that's very constructive. Um, and so I'm typically looking at a stock in the context of dailies, weeklies, monthlies, uh, and I have a sense in my mind for where we are. And even better if I can find you know multiple patterns that are repeating. So I really like it when I find repeating patterns. So. Um, trying to think if I can think of an example where I've seen repeating patterns recently. Um, but I do think like if we go back to AMD on the daily, uh, you know, we can make an argument that that is putting in this kind of inverse head and shoulder ish, right. With the head down to the May 5th lows at 10. Um, and then if we jump to a weekly on AMD, I think we can also kind of make an argument that that, is putting an interesting pattern because last week's candle, for example, you know, we rejected the lows and now it's not a real bullish engulf this week, but you know, we're, we're starting to kind of work our way over the short term moving averages on the weekly, which I think is constructive. So all those sorts of things are, are, are dynamics that I'm looking at. So I try to, I try to actually put it all together. I think you could make an argument on the weekly as well, that we sort of have a big inverse head and shoulder forming as well. So there's an example of potentially month, uh, you know, uh, multiple patterns repeating from the daily to the weekly all right dan foreman that help? yes it helps very much dan foreman has been our guest he's a technology sector specialist at maximum group dan thank you so much for the insight we'd love to have you back oh well thank you very much i really appreciate it it's been a pleasure all right, all right. Whew, a lot of stocks on that one a lot of stocks dennis i don't know if you were taking notes Oh yeah, oh yeah. I got all kinds of notes here. That's a good sit okay. back. I like sitting back and just not taking all that in. So great guests, great uh, information there. Awesome. All right, Let, let's let's move on. I know. Uh, wow, 856 already. So we, we didn't even get really to uh, to ratings today. I don't know if Dennis, if you want me to bring up the the solar thing, or, or we can talk about solar tomorrow. 
uh, since it was talk started. the solar thing first, and we'll just try to fly through ratings. Right, okay. So the decision is coming the, Friday. The, the decision that Gordon Johnson talked about on our show has been talking about now for several months uh, is coming uh, on Friday. So th this is from a good article that I'm reading now, uh, utilitydive.com. But basically, Friday is when the U.S. International Trade Commission will decide whether the importation of cheap solar modules from China has unfairly disadvantaged the U.S. US-based solar manufacturers. So if it does find that uh, that it was harmful, the president will then get to decide whether to impose tariffs or not. So this is coming uh, Friday is when this decision will will be made, uh, whether or not uh, Chinese, Chinese importers did cause harm to US companies or not. And from there, we may or may not get tariffs on these Chinese solar providers. So uh, that, that will be uh, a major catalyst for the entire solar sector. You're going to see first solar Canadian solar CSIQ either move up or down big time on this decision. So it's a major, major decision for those stocks. So treat it like an earnings event. If you're uncomfortable with the risk, don't hold it through it. I do have Canadian solar in my invest portfolio. I haven't decided, you know, I'm sitting up three bucks in there right now, which is, you know, roughly 25%. I haven't decided if I'm going to sell it ahead of time because obviously it could be down probably under 12 bucks. It could be up over 20 bucks on this decision. So it's going to be a big decision for Canadian solar, first solar, and all your um, and a lot of the other solar stocks as well. Dennis, you hung in there. You hung in there on this one. You were up and then you were down, and now it's, uh, boy, yeah, you had 18, around, man. You got to get over 18, Denny. That's what you need in that one. It doesn't, yeah, but okay. So we can say technicals, but, you know, I don't even know if technicals matter in terms right. of the decision is this, you know, important here. So either it's going to blow through 18 on if the decision is good, <laughs> or it's going to go die. And that's the thing, that's the fun thing about technical analysis <laughs> is they'll justify it both ways. If this thing's going over 20, they'll say, oh, it broke out over 18. It was, you know, that was obvious. And if it goes down to 12, they say, well, it broke below 15. So that was obvious technical analyst analysis works perfectly in hindsight but you know it's not as you know predictive as a lot of people like to believe it is and you know we talk a lot about technicals on the show but i think our last guest just summarized it up nice you need to have you know if you're just a one-trick pony you're just looking at charts and that's how you trade i think it's a difficult gig i think you got to incorporate a lot of other thought process into it technical analysis is one tool in the toolbox but i think you know when you can incorporate the fundamentals when you can incorporate you know order flow statistics when you incorporate a lot of stuff different tactics that we talk about on the show you know sentiment um, you know, outlook or the macro, you know, Fed decision stuff. You know, there's so many different things that move stocks, so many different factors. The chart is just one thing that moves stocks when there's no other factors to move stocks. So, you know, for day traders there, maybe intraday traders that, you know, usually the news doesn't come out during the day, you know, maybe there is some, you know, good, you know, you know to focus on your technical analysis. But once you start holding stocks overnight, once you start holding stocks through the earnings reports, I mean, the technical analysis almost matters nothing. When you have an earnings event, if the stock misses big time, the stock's going down. I don't care how pretty the chart looks. So, you know, you've got to, you know, as a longer term investor, you know, as a swing trader, you've okay. got to incorporate some other tools in your toolbox, not just technical analysis. Uh, Danny, one more stock to end the show. And I think uh, Chubbs, our managing editor, is probably sick of me talking about this stock. V-E-R-I, Dennis. It's unbelievable. This uh and this you told me about this stock at 19, Joel. <laughs> I know. And I was like, my buddy bought it. And I was like, because I wanted to get an AR. And you're like, you know, you were saying, you know, that, you know, I don't know if you want to say your source or not, but, um, and I won't uh, diverge your source, but you were saying, you know, um, that your source was saying that they liked this stock. You know, they thought that this was a company, you know, analyzing the fundamentals that this was going to be a good one. And you told me about this at 19 as a good AR play. <laughs> and the stock has been up in 10 days. It's one of the 46. My, my, my buddy who bought it is like, woohoo. <laughs> but you know, the, your, your source just analyzed fundamental data and just looking at, do you want to, you want to no, say No, I was? don't want to. No, I don't yeah, want I'll to. say who it was. So we won't say who it was, but you know, it's just, you know, an analyst and, and obviously, or not even an analyst, just a person who's does a lot of great research. And they were, an, and you asked them for a good AR company. And they're like, this is a good one, man. Were they right? <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. All right, we're going to go to we're, we're going to let you go trade that uh, well, a little after nine. So you missed the nine o'clock news rush. But uh, we're going to go to Spencer. We're going to wrap things up, folks. I will be back on Friday. It's going to be Spencer and Dennis uh, tomorrow. So I don't hopefully there'll be a few lunch bats. I'll be out for the Jewish holiday. 
I'll be back with you on Friday. Go ahead, Spencer. Right, well, real quick, under monthly ratings, real quick. There was just a couple I want to note. Raymond James is upgrading American Airlines and Southwest to Afroform, and they're downgrading United Continental. Uh, so the a little bit of a pair trade going on at Raymond James and the airlines. Uh, Dennis, I think you maybe need to uh, listen to Barclays, get some retail in your portfolio. Barclays is initiating uh, coach at a buy gap gets an, uh, a, a, an over, I'm sorry. Yeah. Coach at, at, at uh, equal weight, excuse me. Uh, gap gets an overweight. Haynes brands gets an overweight. L brands gets an equal weight. Ralph Lauren uh, gets an underweight. Uh, Barclays has a whole note there on the retail uh, this morning there. G, uh, G3 also getting underweight from Barclays. As far as downgrades goes, Cohen downgrades L brands. JP Morgan downgrading 3M to underweight. Uh, and that was with Morgan Stanley downgrading uh, Allergan uh, to equal weight. So those are the big ratings of the day. Okay, that is the show. Uh, for the morning, hope everyone enjoyed it. Hope you, uh, you know, got your questions answered and you can catch the whole show again, uh, as you can every day on our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud and Stitcher The podcast is usually up by around uh, 11 uh, a.m. Eastern time or 1030 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so that's on iTunes, SoundCloud and Stitcher. Just find it by searching for the pre-market prep on any of those sites or go to youtube.com slash TV to catch the show as it aired live so again that's it for us today hope everyone has had a good morning so far and has a good rest of your day and dennis and i will be back with you on thursday